Thank you for coming back for this afternoon's programming. We're going to start with another Future of Technology talk, this one from Ryan Umstadt at Zap Energy. Please join me in welcoming Ryan to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, you know, thank you to the Breakthrough Institute for inviting me to, to be here with you all today and share with you a little bit about um, Zap Energy and fusion and how um, we can bring fusion to the uh, abundance conversation. Um, I'd like to share with you today a little bit about um, what is fusion, what's Zap Energy's approach to getting fusion, um, a little bit about the company, and then I'll conclude with um, recent developments that we've seen in both the, the regulatory space that are pretty exciting, as well as in government affairs and government policy. So um, even with increased renewables penetration, I think everyone here in the room recognizes that there's a, a, a need for firm, flexible, clean power, right? And fusion can actually be that source of on-demand power that is both uh, clean and safe. Um, a little bit about, before we jump into uh, what Zap Energy is doing to, to get to fusion, um, let me say just a brief aside about fuel, right? So fuel for uh, an energy source can come as a solid, like wood or coal. You can bring in a liquid, like gas or diesel. Uh, you can bring it in gas form, like propane or natural gas. The fusion uh, fuel is actually plasma. And what we mean by plasma is it's essentially a gas, but it's a gas where you've now added so much energy to it that you've ripped some of the electrons off of the atoms. So it's a gas, but it's got charged particles. And so it uh, responds differently than just a, a normal gas would, okay? And then the thing I wanna drive home here is that the fuel for fusion doesn't just um, lay around sitting there. You actually have to give it energy just to turn it into the fuel before you can actually get the fusion reaction. And that has uh, you know, implications for the safety of the overall process, right? You have to actually power the fuel even before you can start to power fusion reactions. So the challenge of getting fusion is how do you heat and compress and confine this plasma without letting too much of that energy leak out? You have to do that to get to the actual fusion conditions. Um, historically, the way that we've done that is either with really large magnets, uh, shown here as uh, in the diagram, like ITER, which is a large tokamak being built in France, uses um, high temperature, well, ITER doesn't use high temperature superconducting magnets, but these magnets that are used to confine the plasma must, of course, be protected from the harsh conditions that are generated by the fusion plasma. Um, on the other side is inertial confinement, which again, uh, the, the, the flagship program here is using 192 laser beams fired upon a tiny little pellet of fuel in order to get uh, fusion conditions to occur. Now, we see these, and there's lots of news, and you know, I don't know if you have the same news feed I do, but it seems like every week there's a new fusion record being broken. But the question now before us is, as we're getting closer and closer to break even and beyond that we need to generate a power plant, which of these approaches are actually commercially viable? So if you need to get away from large and expensive magnets or large and expensive lasers, um, what we're, we at Zap Energy are doing is, is looking at a Z-pinch. Um, Z-pinch was actually one of the early approaches to creating fusion energy. Um, based on my high school physics class, just trying to recall it here live in real, real time, um, if you have a current flowing along a Z-direction, so Z-pinch is just named after one of the traditional three-dimensional axes, a current in a Z-direction gives rise to a magnetic field that wraps around a column of plasma with, with no specific sheared flow, and as you progress through time to the right, an instability starts to grow because you're increasing that current and that magnetic field, and within nanoseconds, this thing rips itself apart and the conditions for fusion can't be sustained. Below that is what we at Zap Energy are doing, and that is introducing a difference in velocity. So the outer cylinder of plasma with the larger white arrows is moving a little bit faster than the cylinder of plasma that's just inside of that, which is moving a little bit faster than the overall bulk central part of the plasma. Okay, this sheared velocity flow has a tendency to now smear out any instabilities before they can grow. Think, you know, you're on a highway with many lanes of cars and you're in the middle and you wanna to get to one side or the other. If the cars on either side of you are flying by faster, it's a lot harder to get out of your lane. And that's what we're trying to do here is basically smear out um, any instabilities before they can grow so that the plasma has to stay in its lane. We've now demonstrated that in our experiments, we can keep this plasma stable for thousands of times longer than it should based upon the instabilities that were plaguing the previous Z-pinches. 
So we've got a duration now. We're getting hotter and denser. Um, and we're now going to basically start looking at how do we build a power plant off of this concept. So what does that conceptual reactor look like? Inherently, we're actually a pulsed process. So we are look similar to what you might find in your internal combustion engine, right? Up at the top, we inject some gas. It's our fuel. We energize it. We heat it and compress it. We get the fusion reactions to occur. Uh, we exhaust that gas out, and we repeat the process again. As I mentioned before, our fuel is actually gas. It's a form of hydrogen, isotopes of hydrogen called deuterium and tritium that we can uh, readily either um, get from the market or produce on site. The other key consumable for us is the electrical energy we use to energize this plasma. So our power plant makes a lot of excess energy, which would then turn into electricity, but then we consume a, a fraction of that electricity in order to run this process. So we have an R&D team. Well, actually, a little bit now about the, our company. Um, the company was formed in 2017. We're a spin out from the University of Washington. Um, our co-founders had spent a couple of decades doing the research that basically uh, underpins the results um, that led to the formation of the company. When we formed the company, the experiments in the lab were pushing about 50 kiloamps of current into these uh, Z-pinches. Um, current is a very useful metric for us because it's actually our most direct indicator of how much fusion performance we're going to get out of the Z-pinch. Uh, as you scale up the current, the fusion performance scales very rapidly. So as we spun out the company and moved um, away from the campus and into a private facility, we rapidly increased the current through the pinch up to 300 kiloamps, uh, hit 400 kiloamps, 500 kiloamps was the last year, um, and now we're starting to operate our new system, um, Fuse-Q, which uh, the goal of that system is to get to somewhere around 650 kiloamps, where our models and our theories show that that's the point at which this fusion plasma should start putting out more energy than we actually put into it uh, through the electrical pulses. So it's an exciting time um, in fusion development. Again, even with that sort of break-even condition, which will be a monumental achievement, a lot of hard work now in front of us remaining to get more than break-even and then build a power plant around that. So what are we doing as a company to help commercialize and bring fusion energy to the grid? Well, parallel development, right? It's our fastest path to bringing fusion um, to the grid as, um, in, in, in time to have an impact. Um, so we have an R&D team right now that's focused on developing that plasma, that fusion plasma core, and getting the most performance possible out of it. We have a systems engineering team that is now um, basically developing things like that repetitive pulse power that has to feed the Z-pinch with energy, as well as that liquid metal wall that actually catches all of the fusion energy um, and, and does what we need with all of those products, both generating electricity as well as generating part of our fuel. While we're doing that, we're also now starting to design our integrated demonstration, our prototype. It's basically our concept car, right? That'll be the first time that we bring all of these technologies together, um, and we'll learn a lot from that and use that to inform our more commercially facing pilot plant uh, with the intent here of basically making fusion electricity available to the grid within the decade. So a little bit about um, some recent progress. Um, for the last couple of years, the Fusion Industry Association has been working very closely with our partners at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So NRC is going to basically uh, regulate fusion energy. And so we spent the last two years sharing with them what is fusion, what are its benefits, what are its associated risks and hazards, doing that with the goal of uh, ensuring regulatory certainty. Um, there's been uh, a lot of time and effort on both sides, uh, you know, across the, the industry as well as uh, from the NRC, um, but we're really now at uh, a crucial juncture. Um, the NRC staff will be bringing their uh, options memo and their recommendation to the commissioners in early November. Um, and presently, what, uh, they're, the, the option that they're recommending, at least in their draft form, is that uh, fusion is quite different from fission. Um, it, it doesn't fit or belong under the same Part 50 series of the CFR, um, and that it might actually be a better fit to use something like Part 30, which is used for accelerators or large area irradiators, right? Um, 
quite a different situation for fusion than it would be for advanced fission or traditional fission. Again, when you think of particle accelerators, there's 4,000 of them across the United States. They're used for everything from like ion implantation of semiconductors um, to um, medical services, right? And so the, the hazards and risks of fusion are more closely associated with things that you see with particle accelerators. That gives us a very clear regulatory path. Um, opens up things like only having to do uh, operations permits and not design and construction permits. Opens up things like commercial insurance versus something like under Price Anderson for nuclear. Um, it's going to be a, a huge gain for the fusion community to have that certainty of how we will be treated um, in terms of the regulatory structure. And then finally, um, recent progress in government policy. So um, this past year has been exciting for fusion. Uh, in March, the White House held a, their first ever summit on fusion and announced a bold decadal vision um, that was building off of a lot of recent studies, both from the National Academies as well as the, the plasma science community. The Department of Energy followed up on that bold decadal vision by hosting a workshop in June. And then as of last month, um, in September, they announced a funding opportunity and put that money on the street. Um, this is gonna be a public-private partnership. It's gonna be a milestone-based program for fusion. It's right now to the tune of $50 million, which is relatively small compared to what the fusion industry is ready to tackle. Uh, we could support a much larger program. Um, but what's exciting is that the model for this program is something more like uh, along the lines of what we saw with NASA and their commercial orbit uh, transportation services, uh, where, again, it was much more commercially friendly, um, and it led to the creation of the commercial space industry. It's also similar to the um, Department of Energy's Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program. And so there's, there's a lot of lessons learned that were incorporated into this. It's going to be done through other transactions authorities, which was mentioned a little bit earlier this morning um, by a panel member. And so it's going to be um, a real accelerant to the progress that we can make in the fusion industry and, and as a country in commercializing fusion energy. Um, I also wanted to mention, finally, that that Inflation Reduction Act um, had a couple of good things in there for fusion. One was money for facilities, um, but then also those long-term clean electricity incentives, uh, which, again, we hope to be able to leverage as well. So um, beyond that, again, there's a lot of value um, as the, the capital investment, the private capital that goes into fusion gets larger and larger. The government dollars start to maybe look not quite so important, but there's a lot of value for, for Zap Energy in the value that the government brings both in you know, convening and coordinating across. And so that really is, I think, the primary reason for us to stay involved and engaged with the government policies um, that can influence and help accelerate the commercialization of fusion energy. So thank you all for your time.